And clear of the closing doors, please. What up, somewhat up? Grind and pivot, Louis Max, Queens, New York. You know, I've been waiting a long time to speak with this uh, young lady. Uh, today's guest is a beautiful soul inside and out. She's got an amazing story, up and coming YouTube channel, Convicted Hearts, the beautiful Jen Magana. Jen, how are you? Thank you, Louie. I'm doing pretty good today. How about yourself? I'm great. I'm good. So glad to speak so with you good. finally. For anybody that's listening or tuning in for the first time, you know, there's a small little YouTube uh, family. Actually, there's one who's very, very big, but there's a small YouTube channel out there, Hard Intentions, Mitch Smiley. And he was one of my first guests. And for some crazy reason, there are uh, several people within that group family that became kind of friendly, never meeting before. Really, never really even talking. This is the first time I'm talking with you. But for some reason, there's a bond, there's a camaraderie. So shout out to Hard Intentions. And we've kind of latched on. And um, I want to say thanks so much for taking the time to come on. And you have some story. You have quite a story. Uh, and your channel says a lot about it. Uh, the name of the channel is Convicted Hearts. Check it out on YouTube. We're going to put everything down in the comments and we'll shout it out throughout. And I'm going to talk a little bit here and then we're going to let Jen kind of really give us, you know, a little synopsis of what her channel is all about and really what her story is about. Because I think everybody out there is going to be quite interested in not only the um, ideals of her story uh, or the details, I should say but how she has dealt with it and how she's come from point A, a pivotal moment, point B, and then another pivotal moment, point C. So we're going to try to talk about that. So Jen, give us a little idea of um, what your story in a kind of in a nutshell is all about for the people that are watching first, and then we'll, I'll get you going from there. Uh, my story, I think is about, Probably a girl who thought they came from basically a normal family. And that was to the foundation of death. It was devastated by tragedy twice, actually. It goes deeper than that. But with, with that said, the, the first tragedy was my brother shooting my stepfather in 2004. And that completely rocked our family rocked my world. My stepfather survived, thank God. My brother had a prison term to do. We stuck with him by it that whole time. And we're so hopeful to get him back to his old self prior to the drug use and things that led up to that day. Unfortunately, uh, probably three months after his parole was over, tragedy struck again, and my brother took our own father's life. And that took the wind out of me. Absolutely. Right. Wow. So going back to 2004, the, the, the first time, I mean, your brother was obviously having some troubles, right? Yeah. Prior mm -hmm. to that, did, was he having troubles all along and they were just kind of getting out of hand what what was it like growing up i mean let's go back to you know how, how many is your older brother or younger brother he's younger we're 14 months apart to the day everybody always thought we were twins until maybe we were about four and five and he got a lot bigger so everybody thought he was older than me but he was younger you know that's something that it's interesting you ask that because i was not ready to face the reality of what my childhood really was like until very recently. Part of that being out of respect for the fact that my father had passed, I was afraid to touch on some of the reality of our past with our dad. Um, our dad was a very stern, strict man, 
there was a lot of physical abuse. Uh, he was in the military. He worked in the prison system. He was a correctional officer at Solidad Prison. So you had a link. You had your, you know, obviously your whole childhood you was dealt with some of these anxieties, the walking on the eggshells, oh, which yeah. basically translates into some of the videos that you have spoken about prior to. Right. So this is really separate. It is. I hadn't, like I said, I was so, it's still uh, somewhat uncomfortable to speak about, but it's the truth, right? So if I don't deal with it now, then I'm never going to. So your brother uh, and you, you, was he aware? Was your brother in the same boat? Or was it a little different because he was male and you were a female? Was that did that have anything to do with it, or was everybody was kind of under the gun and under the the rule of of your dad? We were pretty equally under the rule of my dad. But, um, I think the discipline was pretty equal, and um, we both we both dealt with that equally. Do you know why? Because you obviously you know saw it from from an outside. You were on the inside, but you were watching. So you could probably put your finger on when things started to go, you know, in a bad way. Right. Well, I would say that from a very young age that my brother and I both were brought up in an environment where it was encouraged um, to fight for, uh, you know, don't let anyone humiliate you, put you down, uh, make fun of you. This was encouraged. and. Unfortunately, it was even applauded. I think especially my brother being a male, it created sort of a, a sense of pride when he would get into an altercation and come out on top, you know? Mm -hmm. So those are very formative years. So you're 11 and 12. Um, so your parents split. He was not living there. You lived with your mom at the time? Right. We lived with our mom. Right. And, uh, shortly... Shortly after the divorce, my mom remarried, and she married a detective in our local sheriff's department. Okay. Right. And how was that in terms of day-to-day uh, -day life? Things were good, or you were confused? Were you a happy camper, or you were starting? Where were you at? at 11 and 12? I mean, a lot of kids at 11 and 12 are starting to sow their oats a little bit, right? Um, yeah. You know, uh, it was a bit confusing. It, it was. When my parents were married, even though there was the dysfunction that was there, we were in church probably three and four days a week. There really? was a routine for everything. Um, after they divorced, it was sort of the more free, you know, you can go if you want or you can stay home. And my brother, I noticed really, in my opinion, anyways, I'm not trying to speak for him, but what I what I noticed is he really rebelled against anything that we knew prior to the divorce. And he really started to go out and hang out with older people and, you know, right. Drugs, drugs, yeah. drink. Yeah, drugs. I mean, you know, 12, I mean, you know, it's funny too, because we, you know, at 12, 13, I guess, we, we, every, I think we, everybody kind of started experimenting mm -hmm. a little bit. But, you know, we all we started smoking pot a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, kids would drink here and there, you know, yeah. uh, experiment a little more. Some went off the deep end. Some didn't. Did, was he getting in trouble as well? Or, you know, what he was looking. I guess he was looking for some sort of uh, some bonding with somebody uh, yes. else outside of what he was not yeah. getting. That's a good way to put it. Uh, he was he was looking to fit in. And he was looking for that, I think, acceptance, especially from, you know, older guys. What, what was school like? Did you go to school? Were you going to school? Were you doing well? Were you doing okay? What was, for you me, know, what was happening? School, school was a struggle for myself. I have tremendous social anxiety. Um, okay. I was a kid. So it was really difficult for me. And I actually got into a lot of a lot of physical fights. I was kicked out of sixth grade. So kicked out of Christian school, sent to the public school. Were you, why was violence, a, you know, why were you going with violence as a first thing to settle? Do you think something you learned or? 
do. I think it was a learned behavior. Um, even to this day, there's certain things that, you know, can be a trigger. And for myself, it might be nothing to someone, but loud noise is an instant uh, trigger for me. It always meant some sort of violence was happening. Interesting. Fire in the home. So I would ah. convince. Okay. 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 So what would you, what, what could you tell? Like, that's a good moment that, you know, that's a pivotal moment right there for I'm thinking about, you know, knowing now for somebody who's young and that age going back, you know, how you have any advice for them on, on just on that issue alone? You have any advice after thinking this through? I would say that try to be encouraged. Things will not always stay the same. And one day you will be in control of your own environment and your own life. You won't always be under somebody's thumb and you can choose who you surround yourself with. So hang in there. Don't give up. And you're worthy of peace and love. Right. So how I'm assuming, you know, now as a mom, how important uh, the nurturing of you know, whether you, a family, uh, whether it be one parent, two parent, whatever. I mean, there's got to be, you know, that 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 end that doesn't break down in some sort of way for young, young people. It's very difficult without it. You agree? I think being a, actually I attribute that to saving me from many of the things that my brother and relatives and friends actually Experienced. I became a mom at barely 16 years old. That's Out right. You were, that's right. Your teen mom. Yeah, that's correct. There, wow. It was a very traumatic situation that happened, and I became a mother. Right. So fast forward, and you came 16. You be you. So were you going to school? Did you go to high school? I went to middle school. I wasn't allowed to walk for graduation because of my troubles with getting in fights. I went to my first. Uh, year of high school and was kicked out because of fighting. So I was sent to a continuation school where, you know, the trouble kids go. Right. And I was attending that school while pregnant. Any counseling, any therapy uh, during the, during that time? There was periods of time when I, I had tried to harm myself out of desperation. I would say maybe when I was 12, when the divorce was happening. And then maybe when I was around 15, when that uh, traumatic event had happened uh, to me, I kept that to myself. So it was very, um, it was eating away at me. I didn't know how to deal with it. And I was ashamed. Yeah, it seems like you were kind of on your, you were really, really on your own. And um, doing some things to yourselves that was hurtful. Then you'd get into the system a little bit. They try to help you. And then what they they let you out. Um, so the medication, did it help or it just was something like a Band-Aid at the time? I think it was a Band-Aid. I think I kept most of my feelings and thoughts to myself because I didn't want to bring embarrassment or shame on my family. I always felt like I was kind of like the black sheep, I, I felt like I was just, I was troubled. So I tried not to make a big deal out of what I was feeling or going through. Right. I didn't reach out like I should have. Yeah. I so exactly. So looking back, so I guess advice would be for someone to, you know, at that, at some point early on, you must raise your hand for help. It's okay. The one thing I always, like I said, I felt embarrassed. Like I was, it was weird or something was wrong with me. Most of my friends during that time were coming from homes where their parents were addicts and alcoholics. So they were already um, using. So their advice probably would have been here, take this, yeah. drink this, right. forget about it, you know? Okay. Yeah. So you weren't really surrounded with, with, with that. Uh, uh, that much of a positive force. So you got, you got pregnant at 16. 
I'm sorry, really pro- a little bit before uh, boyfriend, right before, yeah. boyfriend or, uh, you know, a, you know, when, we, when we're 15, 14, 13, you know, we have relationships sometimes that think they're never going to end, you know, that this is my guy, this is my girl, you know, I think back to, you know, you're my old girlfriends and stuff and you, you, you know, yeah. you thought you, uh, you thought you were going to get, you know, you're going to go into the sunset with them, but that did oh, yeah. not happen, yeah. right? Well, it did not happen, and here's why. My boyfriend was the person that prompted me. Right. You talk about that a little bit. I know, yeah. right, you've put that out there. Um, so that was something that uh, your actual boyfriend took advantage. Yes, yes. I was, uh, even though I was surrounded by all this trauma and depression and things like that, that part of life, um, as far as preparing me for becoming a young woman and the things that happened, was not talked about. It was very much cut and dry. That's something that happens when you're married. Uh, if not, you go to hell, and that's that. Right. That's what you thought. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. That's why I never even told when it happened, because I was so terrified right. that it had caused this to happen. Yeah, yeah. So religion really did play quite a part in your upbringing, yeah. correct? I mean, and you know, there's one thing to be spiritual and within and, and the soul. I get it, but it, you know, it, it really, really did play a, a big part in the way you actually thought. Huge, huge, and that's part of where I have had to come to a place in my life now that yes, I am, and still. I'm a believer. I consider myself a Christian. Okay. But I, I refuse to judge other people. That's where so much of my guilt and shame almost took me out because of the, the organization part of it, the judgment, the looking down upon, and, uh, oh, well, you know, hellfire and damnation right. you know, really affected me. Right. Right. You know, it's funny. I watch when I watch you and I listen and then now speaking to you, it's I, I, you get a whole different, uh, a whole different vibe, you know, a feeling where uh, it must have really, really been very, very, very difficult for you to navigate, you know, because you're on your own. You sound like you, you sound like you really were on your own. It's like you're almost like a lot yeah. of kids. What happens is you dig the you dig a hole and then. You're in that hole and, you know, then you finally can get bailed out. But you're, you know, you dug, you, you, the hole just kept on going and going and you're getting sucked in. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have all this in, in, in front of you. So, I, I mean, it's amazing, you, I, you know, what you, yeah. what you become. That's one thing that I do remember saying to myself as a young person, thinking anyways, I didn't say it audibly i thought you may have taken this from me but you won't you won't take my faith all right so let's get back to your brother for a second because that's that i mean you know obviously things are going uh in your life there you're dealing with it you're doing what you have to do i'm assuming uh you know, people are trying to help you as best they can, family, aunts, whatever, whatever they can. They're trying to be, I guess they're trying to be as supportive as they know how. Maybe they didn't know either, you know, maybe as you look back on it, I mean, you know, we look back on our parents, you know, maybe they weren't taught. Maybe they didn't understand. And it just becomes one of those vicious cycles. So your brother is getting violent what's happening with that where did the violence come in where did that come in i feel like it was always in him honestly um not to the degree that it would play out but there was always a level of violence that was present Um, but during i think high school years it really started to show and unravel there were several incidents i mean local Local law enforcement, you know, knew him very well. Right. But they knew him, you know, for obvious reasons. So how did, what happened with the first altercation? How did that, was that for a reason? Was that, or is that something that just kind of bubbled up? As far as with my 
stepfather. I was out of the home at that at that time. I had um, married early, my first marriage, and was out of the home. I think a lot of things went on here and were never spoke about to me. There many, I would just say, like a lot of secrets were kept about how bad things really were. Sure. In the house. Yeah. I, I think a lot of families do that, you know, but I was even out of the loop about how bad things got. And drugs were a huge factor. Um, and he was really into bodybuilding now. I mean, he had won trophies, championships. Okay. So, so was, steroids? Uh, so he was juicing up plus the drugs. I mean, we're not talking, we're not talking pop. No. So this is, so he was bodybuilding. So he was obviously had the enhancements going on and he was competing. Yeah, he was competing. I think one of the contests he won was called best chest in the West. He had a trophy for that. And um, young age and see, once he got that size and was so, his appearance, you know, really caught people's eye. He, he started to hang out with these older Italian guys and um, they really took him in under their wing, if you know what I mean. So he's getting deeper and deeper and, and he obviously they're giving him a sense of being so, wow, Jesus. Yeah. He was being taken on trips that I could only dream of, you know? Yeah. 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 Was, yeah. Right. So how do so just fast forward to the, the first altercation, what, what, how, how did that, you know, what happened there? I think it was the, the strange thing is about my family. I mean, I don't know if it's strange because I've only known this family, but there's so many things that are just never spoken of. So I can only say what I think. And what I think is the drugs combined with, okay, here's my new stepdad who's now putting his foot down in my dad's home made him feel a sense of, wait a minute, who are you? And um, the drugs only fed and led up to a situation where it created, yes, there was, there was issue there between them a little or a lot, but I think the drugs fed that paranoia and um, it led up to my stepfather being shot in our family home. He was shot right. twice. From an, during an argument, during an argument, uh, just and what I hear. And like I said, my stepfather's never told me, my brother has never told me there's a third party that probably doesn't want to be identified. That's told me what was said to them. And it was sort of like in the middle of the night thing or early morning. And my stepfather walked out into the living room. My brother was already awake out there and had been awake probably for several days there was no argument he shot him the first time uh right behind the right eye and the second time in the torso and thankfully my stepfather did not lose consciousness right away so he was able to run into my mom's room while she was sleeping and he pushed the dresser in front of the door and was saying, he shot me, he shot me. And she called 911. Traumatic, traumatic for all, yeah. all absolutely all involved. How, how, how are you, how do you feel when you, right. when you kind of talk about it? Is it, is it therapeutic to a point now uh, for you when you speak about this you know, other things happened, obviously. Is it therapeutic for you? It is therapeutic to me now. And that might sound strange to some people. But for me, it is a sense of this happened. I'm okay. I This validates some of the feelings I've had and the things that I've dealt with. Mm. Maybe some of the reason I am the way I am. And if I can share not for, you know, I'm a very shy person. I, I originally, even starting this whole thing, I didn't even want to show my face on camera. It's very awkward for me. But if I can help someone that thinks that maybe they're in a, a situation in life or in their family that's 
so odd that nobody else is going through it or it's so embarrassing, they can see that these things do happen, you know, a lot more common than you may think. And you can make it through that and you can even use your experience to help others and help yourself fall out of that. Definitely. So he um, went to prison for a certain amount of time and he did get out. Now, during the time he was in prison, uh, did you, were you visiting? Were you a supportive family member yes. uh, as best as you could be? How was that for you? What was that like for you when you went in? Seeing him, obviously you're going to be happy to see your loved one no matter what, but then you're instantly struck with the dingy prison blues they're in, uh, their scruffy appearance or, you know, it's not like they're, they're given a clean shave or any, we know that, you know, he had lost weight. He, it seems like he, it seems like he had aged probably 10 years instantly. So here was this tough guy, you know, it looked like a lot of the people around him um, probably had a healthy amount of respect or fear for um, just, you could pick up on vibes in the, in the visiting room, but leaving them. It's like, uh, you know, it breaks your heart every time. Of course. Leaving them behind. At a dirty, nasty, hot facility. So you try and, you know, when you're there, you get to buy food out of vending machines. So yeah. We would all take as many quarters as allowed, you know, per person. We'd buy him as much food as we could. We'd normally ask him ahead of time, hey, what do you want? You know, if they have certain things in the vending machine, do you want a pizza, burrito? We'd try and get him as full as possible, knowing that. They're not fed like that on a regular basis. Right. So you basically eat till he was sick and then the visit would end and you get a very quick hug is all you're allowed. And then goodbye. Yeah, I'm thinking, did your you know your dad was a correctional officer, right? Obviously at a different oh. at a at a at a right. uh, at Soul Day, you said, right? Yes. So uh your dad could not uh have any influence on watch out for my boy kind of thing it was, or it was just one of those things where it was just this that guy would have brought yeah that would have brought probably more heat his way more heat his way yeah there was there were correctional officers that knew obviously because my dad had worked for solid for so long and word travels in those prisons it's a very uh there's a lot yeah. of time yeah, there is. There is. It's a, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a different world for sure. Yes. Yeah. They know who's coming down, you know, and being sent where. And a lot of people knew. But you see, my dad would go visit with us sometimes. And that was one of his fears is always being recognized. Sure. And actually, that did happen in one of the visits. And uh, it led to a situation where I'll just say my brother had to deal with someone afterwards oh boy wow so you he did his time he got out were you guys welcomed did you you welcomed him home you did you get him kind of on his feet again what were his plans once he once he got out we uh my mom myself and our real dad picked him up from the bus station he was i think the only um formerly incarcerated person that had family there to pick them up. Everybody else got a bus ticket and was put on a greyhound. Right. Fend for themselves. Right. Yeah. So we picked him up. I think we went to Denny's and he ate a lot. <laughs> sure. And, um, we stopped at a Walmart on the way home. What was the conversation like? What was the conversation like at, De at Denny's? Could you bring us to the table mm -hmm. for a second? If you, if you recall. Yeah. It was just like a, a joy that had been missing for so long. We were talking about plans for the future, seeing the kids. And, you know, he already had a, a list of different things that I make that he wanted for dinner for the next week. Right. Um, we were going to just 
go right back to old times. Okay, and that and and that there's a fork in a road somewhere. Yeah, uh, and that was that was fairly recent after he got out. I can honestly say that I I recognized immediately he had changed. Uh, you know, rightfully so, being in there that long, he would change. Right. Any programs? Was he able to, you know, did he take the programs? Was he able, were there programs? You I know? think he was in quite a bit of trouble his first term. He was involved in a riot and in, a, in the hole for about nine months. So I think a lot of damage was done to his psyche. You know, I'm not quite sure about, I don't think there was many programs that he was involved in. Right now, he was he. Ha- what did he have help? Was anybody helping him? So, I, mean, I know his pro officer was one thing, but I'm talking about really somebody like in his corner, kind of keeping him, you know, on a, on a path. Or, or he, or he was really kind of fending for himself. He was living with our our biological dad, with our real dad. Our dad had okay. at that point bought a home. His plan was for my brother and him to work on it together and live there together. My dad. Yeah had stayed a bachelor. He wanted him and his boy to work on this home and bond and make a life of it, you know? I think that, yeah, they just started butting heads. Uh, Old ways came up, and um, two men that were both very much alike and uh, very bullheaded started to clash. Something I wish I would have recognized or seen, but... I could have never guessed what was coming. And if you want to talk about it, can you? I mean, what what, what actually ha- what, what actually did happen? Uh, not in detail, obviously, but uh, you know, I guess things came to a head. So, jumping forward to what actually happened, um, my brother had started to change, and uh, he started staying home and not leaving the house at all. So that was concerning also because I recognize that as not being normal, you know. Paranoia, something going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Getting rid of everything, all of his personal belongings. Uh, it was just things were changing. But then again, my dad wasn't always telling me what was happening there. So at one point nearing what happened, my dad had bought a brand new like fifth wheel trailer to, to go camping and travel the U S and that's what he wanted to do when he retired and he had retired. So I had heard, okay, your dad and brother are going to go on this fishing trip and they're going to be gone a couple of weeks. So I thought, well, that's odd. You know, he hasn't really left the house, but maybe this will be good for them. Yeah, for sure. My dad and brother both love to fish hunt. So a couple of weeks go by, maybe in close to three weeks. And I thought, how, how weird, you know, I haven't really heard from my dad yet. And we didn't talk to each other every single day, but, you know, he would check in, I would check in. So I started calling his cell phone and it would just go right to voicemail. Um, I would leave voice messages and I started thinking, I started trying to think about what our last conversation was. I, I was thinking, did I say something to upset him? Ah, you thought it was you him? Is yeah. he mad at me? Right, is he mad at you, right. Yeah, I even sent a message saying, Dad, if I said something to upset you or or did something, I'm so sorry. You know, I know your birthday is coming up. Please call me back. I want to do something for you. And I heard nothing. So I started expressing my concern to some family members. And most of them were kind of like, don't get involved. Don't, don't go poking around, you know, wait for your dad to come around. Well, finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I went over to my dad's house and I realized, okay, his truck is there. And the trailer is parked in front of the home. So I knock on the door. I can hear things moving around inside, but nobody answered. The next day I went back, I think it was two, possibly three days I did this. I went back, my brother answered the door, and his appearance shocked me. Uh, He looked very thin, like a deer in the headlights, uh, 
had jeans and his boots on, but no shirt. Strung out. Yeah. And it was, I don't know how to explain it other than some people pick up on things like I can, I felt something was different. In the, like it smelled different, felt empty. I didn't smell dad's coffee or sawdust from his table saw. It just felt odd. And I asked where dad was. He said he went on a walk. I went back the next day and knocked on the door. The same thing. Dad's on a walk. So time I thought, mm, I don't know. I'm going to stay in town and wait you know, two, three, four hours and go back in the same day. So when I did that, I thought, well, maybe I should go to the local Starbucks and ask if they've seen my dad because he would go there every day and read his paper. I did that. I showed a picture of him from my phone to the girls that worked there. And I remember her face just, she was like, no, I haven't seen him in a long time. Yeah. I went back to my dad. My brother answered the door and I said, where's dad? And he said on a walk. And at this point it was like four hours later. So I said, well, do you mind if I use the restroom? I had to walk all the way to the back of the house to use the restroom. And doing that, I had to pass all three bedrooms. The first bedroom my dad used as an office and that door was slightly ajar. and I could see as I passed without making it too obvious I was looking that his new chair he had just bought was turned over backwards. There was a lamp um, broken and crashed on the floor. Pictures were off the wall. So it was a clear sign that an altercation had taken place. Sure. And then I felt fear instantly. I really just went in the restroom long enough to stand there and then turn around and come out. And when I came out, I really believed that my brother, even in his state of mind, knew that I knew something was not right. So, uh, right. And then when I said, I love you, he, he looked at me and said, do you? And I said, yeah, I do. You know, I do. And he said, I love you too. I walked out the door. As I walked out the door, I knew I had to call for a welfare check. I had to. Um, I passed, I had to pass around the trailer as I left. And I thought, let me just look around and see if there's a ticket on it. Because I know you're not supposed to have a vehicle that large parked in the city. There was no tickets on it. But as I looked back at the house, I could see my brother staring at me through the kitchen window. And it just gave me an, an eerie feeling. You know, got in my car and left, came home, called for a welfare check. This is on a Sunday, around five or six. I didn't receive a phone call. So I thought, okay, they've probably located my dad, you know. But my cell phone rang at 11.55 at night with a county number. Oh, boy. So I was wrong if the county is calling you at that time. Um, it was a detective. I forget his name. He just had a very cool, cold disposition. He just blurted out, said, I'm here at your dad's residence. We found his body wrapped up and tucked under a mattress in his travel trailer, and your brother's being charged with his homicide. It took, I didn't know how it happened. They didn't tell me. I was not aware that my, my father had been deceased as long as he had been. Right. I even asked them, are you sure it's my dad? Maybe it was someone else. And they said, no, it's your dad. I had to wait, I think it was 10 days for an autopsy to be done. And uh, there was only one person for three counties doing yeah. the time. So I got a phone call 10 days later and they said, uh, yeah, your father was, was murdered. 
uh, his neck was broken. Did you ever get to talk to your brother? He was not himself, obviously. Unfortunately, my brother never even made a statement uh, regarding what happened. He never even spoke to, obviously, to any cop. So I, to this day, don't know exactly what happened. I know that uh, the argument the public defender had was they got into a physical altercation and something happened that caused my dad's neck to be broken. And she said, you know, her defense was my brother panicked knowing he was already a felon and tried to cover up the crime. But my brother never spoke. No, I received a letter probably two years after my brother apologizing for the hurt he caused. I think that was the first time just seeing his handwriting, you know, I really just fell apart because in my mind, as strange as it may sound, I had for survival tried to convince myself that my brother and my dad both were gone. What's that like? What kind of, what, what, what's it like uh, living, you know, with this, now where uh, your brother is incarcerated. Do you speak to him? Do you write to him? Uh, you, what's your relationship with him? I do now. Presently. Yes, right. I do now. Right. I think it was about the third year in. Um, he had been moved closer for some medical treatment. And I had the opportunity to go visit. Him. And when I saw him, the first thing that hit me, I had never thought this in our entire lives. I always thought he looked like my mom's side of the family. He looked exactly like my dad. It's interesting as we get older, you know, how really things start to evolve through, you know, tragedy, through, you know, good things, bad things. But wow, that's that's an that that is just an amazing uh, an amazing story. But I think what what's what's interesting is is that you know. It's me, you, what you are, you know, today. Are people, you know, hitting you up for, for advice or do you have you from your channel? Uh, have you uh, made, you know, contacts with other folks that, you know, might need help? Do they ask questions? Do they ask for support? Yeah, I have. I have. And several, actually, all of all of which, you know, request to remain anonymous. So I've always honored that, but of many of them are going through um, a, a sibling who's murdered a family member, a spouse who's done so. Um, some of them are still going through the trial of these things. And I'm just trying to be a light in their life as much as I can and encourage them that you are not your loved one's crying that doesn't reflect on you, even though other people make us feel like, oh, that's, I've even had someone in the store, I overheard whisper, that's that girl whose crazy brother murdered their dad. Right. And that's such a cool feeling. Yeah, that's horrible. That's horrible. Yeah. Right. So I just to encourage them and let them know you're not your loved one's crime and you don't need to be ashamed for still loving them. There's no, you don't have to like what they did because I don't, I still have moments where I'm angry, but I have to work through that because I do still love him. He is my brother. He's your bullet. Yep. 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 Right. And, and you, you know, still really don't know. I, I, I don't. Yeah. You still really don't know. You, yeah. you know, you, I, I'm sure you really kind of deep down inside, you know, obviously want to know. Not to say yeah. what, not what happened, not what happened, but what, you know, what, you know, how can we curb this? How, why does this happen? Yeah. The way, unfortunately, the way my mind is, I am one of those people that wish I knew every detail. You want, oh, you want to know? I know that's probably not the best. Yeah. I'm one of those that dissects everything, you know, but I know I never will because I know well enough to know he won't speak. Well, um, never say never, but, but I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. This is what also brought me to the point where I talked about in the beginning. I 
I had to face what our childhood was like. I had suppressed that for so long. Um, out of embarrassment and shame, but also because I did get the opportunity for my father to apologize to me as an adult. And he made peace with me and apologized for how he was to us as children. He, he cried. He was sincere. And I, I saw the change in him. So wow. I know victim of what he had done. Right. So you like actually said, could understand as you were older, you also, he, he yeah. came, he, you know, like we said before, you know, listen, you know, we become parents and, you know, we, we do the best we can, but at the same time, you know, we sometimes, you know, our parents had, we don't know how they were parented and how, and, and right. what their right. trials and tribulations yeah. might've been. You got, but you don't find the bad thing about it is when you're a kid, you have no clue. You don't understand. And you, find out much, much later in life yeah. when you're older or that parent's not with you. Right. Yeah. It's a tough, tough. It's it, That's a tough one. Wow. Right. right. And that's, that's it. And my father, you know, like I said, it was always, not that it makes it any better. It was always only physical abuse, but that created, you know, a series of events and emotions and dysfunction that traveled for so many years. And I, I do know now that my father was severely abused by his own father. So yeah. I have broken that cycle, thank God. I would never parent in that way. Or So I do take a sense of, you know, I, I learned from what I went through, and I will never pass that down through my children, grandchildren, you know. I'm always going to show them, hey, you, you might have messed up, but I love you, so I want you to do better. Absolutely. I mean, that's a great that's a great mantra. Of course, of, you know, there's no reason, you know, the violence, the the physical abuse. There's, you know, there really is no there's no there's no reason for it. There's no room for it. But you know, you have to preach that as well. And, and I think that's something with your, you know, your platform as well, your YouTube channel, you know, is lifting others like that, you know, let them know that, you know, your story is one, but it does not need to be, you know, continuing. It does not to be not have to be a cycle. The YouTube channel, it's Convicted Hearts. I, I love when you, uh, you know, you post, as I said, it's, you know, I, I watch all the time and I look forward to it. Tell, tell us a little bit. I do enjoy it. And it's been so therapeutic to me. I never would have imagined that I'd ever speak about any of this, especially publicly. Um, I remember the first time that I, I emailed Adrian Smiley and I reached out to her and that really opened up. Um, it opened up a whole chapter of me allowing myself to free my heart from all of these burdens and speak. She has been an awesome friend and a, uh, as you know, a solid, solid person. Yeah, real solid. Shout out hard things. Adrian, yeah. the, the backbone Adrian. of the operation. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Adrian and Mitch are awesome. Yeah. Well, I want to say thank you so, so much to you. Um, I hope you had fun. It was a pleasure. I think we learned quite a bit, you know, Obviously, your story is is quite fascinating, quite interesting. But I think more than that, it's you know you're really you're genuine, and you know you're willing. I think what's a beautiful thing is you're willing to uncover a little bit about who you are to help others. What's what's the future for Punch? The future, let's see, just be yeah, continue. Uh, to help people with the channel, through the channel, to continue to grow, encourage others, continue with my mission to forgive and show compassion, even to those that, you know, people will never probably thought that I would be able to do that with my own brother, but I, of course, I work on that daily. So I want to teach my children those things, you know, and just to have a good heart. My kids are going to 
One is in college, one is about to go into her junior year, one is going into third grade. I just want to be a good mom, a good support system, a good friend. Shout out to Hard Intentions family. Um, shout out Absolutely. to you. you. have been such a blessing. Um, seriously in my life i wish you only good things i mean i think you know the success you are successful in in in, in a major way you're doing great i want you to continue doing great yeah shout out to you know you as well and you know adrian and mitch of course and you know big max yes. you know big, big max. max big max yes. We got to say that, right? Uh, and, the, and the whole yeah. family, and the whole family. Whole you know, it's yeah. crazy because you know we talk about that, and I've talked about this many times that we, you know, now have like this little, you know, the social media people, you know, that are f- kind of friends, but there's not many. I mean, there's a, there's, yeah. there's a couple here, you know, Tashunka, right. and um, there's a yes. couple of people, Ham yes. Fam. You know, there's a couple of people out there that we engage with. Right yeah. on a regular basis, yeah. but you see the same Zeus, you know, you see the yes. same Zeus Labar, you see the same people. So if we missed you, you know, you we're always thinking, hey, but I, I just love the fact that the, yes. the camaraderie is there, and that's something that ha- that is completely new to me, you know, as well as me. It's been very new to me, and you know, it's felt really good to have that. Yeah, and I think that's imp- and I think it's important as well. So uh, I want to say thanks again to Jim Magana, Convicted Hearts YouTube channel, amazing. Check it out. Like, subscribe, comment below. Grind and Pivot is here. We're still rocking. We got new stuff coming in. Uh, pivotal moments have changed everything. Love yes, you, Jen. Grind and Pivot. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Peace, everybody.